Hello, hello, greetings to all our listeners and welcome to another captivating episode of What's Doing. I'm your host, Abid, founder and CEO of Creative Stew. And we have an exceptional treat for all you film enthusiasts out there. In our studio today, we have a towering figure of the Malaysian film industry. A man whose talent and vision have left an incredible mark on national and international cinema. He is an award-winning actor, a prolific producer, and a gifted scriptwriter. Please join me in welcoming Bron Palare. Bron's journey in cinema is very diverse and very impressive. From his gripping performances in films like Psycho Penchuri Hati and Tarbayak Dari Langit, to his groundbreaking work in Anakhalal and Beluka. He has continuously pushed the boundaries of storytelling and let's not forget his contributions on the international stage with the Indonesian superhero franchise Gundala from the Bungi Lagit universe. Today we are going to delve into Bronze World, exploring his creative process, his perspectives on the Malaysian film industry and his experience in working across borders. So without further ado, let's dive into this fascinating conversation. Welcome to What's Doing. Thank you so much, Bron, for joining us for this podcast, What's Doing. It's a great honor for us to have you in the studio. Thank you for having me. How has it been for you to be working in Malaysian and Indonesian film industry, especially in projects like Gundala? And uh, how did it influence your approach to acting and storytelling? I think just as in any other projects or any other field, I think we, we, we serve the materials in hand. Uh, we serve the vision. And even locally, I mean, like in Malaysian project, like whenever you serve different, different directors, they have different uh, preferences when it comes to acting in terms of uh, style, in terms of tone, in terms of interpretation. Uh, but in a nutshell, I would say whenever you work with good directors, it doesn't matter where you work. Uh, Malaysia, Indonesia is the same because the, the, the language of uh, cinematic language or visual language is pretty much the same. The language of drama which is body language and emotion. Uh, we are all human beings, so we're actually using the same grammar, except the same, uh, slightly different. The, the slight differences would be, I think, the language of the spoken language, which are the dialogues. But um, what are the cultural differences when it comes to production, when it comes to storytelling? I'm, I'm walking on a tight rope, trying not to <laughs> antagonize. So, uh, it's... I think when it comes to approach due to the fact that the Malaysian are of the intention, because we are working with so limited resources. So I'm trying to, to make it like a, a comparison between apple and apple and not apple and orange. Um, so due to the fact that we are so uh, limited by resources that the whole idea is how can we maximize everything. So if you have one ringgit, how can we make the production looks two ringgit? Um, despite we can only, you know, we can only afford one ringgit. And, and with that in mind, sometimes like, you know, half of the battalion will have to be killed <laughs> in order to reach that value. Whereby in the Indonesia, I think it's more towards control. We have one ringgit. Let's go and nail this one ringgit for sure. And in the process of doing it with, with a bit more control, highly likely we're going to get one and a half ringgit. And most of the time they get one and a half ringgit, whereby for us is 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 like you know you 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 go into a battlefield already exhausted of your resources because during pre-production you squeeze everything ready, and then just take one little bump for everything just go haywire. Uh, whereby over there there's a lot of cushioning, mm -hmm. so once you have a lot of cushioning, whatever happened along the way, you kind of like sort of, ah, oh, we can we can pull these resources, we can pull that resources. I think that's that's the major differences. Are you happy with what you have achieved in the Malaysian film market? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's always, but I'm, I'm, I'm thankful, I'm grateful, Alhamdulillah, I think. For someone like me, I shouldn't be uh, achieving whatever I've achieved so far in terms of opportunities, in terms of being given the, the the chances to work with all the the local grades, I would say pretty much I've worked with all of them. So in, in that regard, I would say, yeah, thankful and grateful. But in terms of things that we can achieve 
could have achieved, uh, should achieve, and and intend to achieve. I think there's plenty more to achieve or plenty more to do. Um, we are not that far out compared to our neighboring countries, but just like in not to say competition, but just like in any endeavors, if we are uh, lagging behind, uh, we have to work twice harder in order to catch up, let alone to exit uh, whoever in front of us. So there's plenty to do. In your experience, how does the Malaysian film industry is compared with the ASEAN uh, ASEAN counterparts regarding creativity, production quality, and market reach? I think the general perception normally would say, "Yeah, we are lagging. We are lagging behind. We are." I would say we do progress. We have progress. Maybe not at the rate where everybody wanted it. Looking at you know Thailand, Indonesia, they have uh, you know a lot of things. So, uh, and people will say, yeah, but look at our neighboring countries. They are they are coming up with you know Gadis uh, The Thai have the cooking show and and the things like that. So everyone was talking about the neighboring countries and you know feel insecure, inferior, and small and things like that. And but I think we have achieved uh, some sort of progress in terms of narrative. I think technique. Uh, we could say a lot in terms of audience taste have also sort of uh, not to say improved, but I think progress. Uh, you could see project like High Council uh, now yours going into the market. Uh, I think the audience are a bit more sophisticated now uh, with narrative, uh, with challenging narrative, innovative narratives. It's just that we are not progressing as fast as the neighboring countries. And I think the next question would be how should we, <laughs> how should we, what what should we do in order to progress that much? But I think you can only crawl before you can walk, and then only you can run. That's a great answer. But tell me, what is holding uh, that that progress back? Conviction, maybe. I think the first is always been conviction. Uh, before the journey, nobody ever crossed, um, or nobody ever thought of having a ten million movie collection at the box office. And then uh, I think Kong Si came and break broke it and then people say yeah the ceiling was 15 and the next thing you know we get the journey making uh, 18 and then yeah the ceiling is 25 and then uh, Mamad Khalid and Munafik too came and then somebody said yeah probably the ceiling is 50 then Mark Kilau came in 97 and, and shattered broke everything, everything, shattered yeah. everything so I think it's about conviction the first thing is always conviction it's much easier once you get that out of the way um, and then once that happened it's more on the process um, now there's also capital or liquid, which is, you know, to have a, a conviction. Once you have conviction, you need aspiration, you need vision, and then execution. So I think we are moving from one phase to another, and and right now maybe we just pass the conviction part, and uh, people start having aspiration to see, and slowly it materialize. You get to see local content in international streaming platform. Um, Hopefully, within this couple of years, our execution, our output can be consistent and gain some traction regionally in order for us to be able to make larger shows, better shows. And I think that's that's the way to progress. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. Because at this point in time, every OTT platform or streamer has a Malay language show. Yeah. So whether it's View, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Netflix, they are considering our uh, content uh, as as something which which audiences like, I think at least they are doing their A B testing role. <laughs> <laughs> like like you know like okay let's let's have some allocation and test the audience and see whichever. And I think there's also we need to see the correlation between the output and also the demand mm -hmm. and the audience demographic, uh, especially with streaming platforms because uh, the bulk size of our mainstream audience, uh, the one that goes to cinema, I would say 90% don't subscribe to streaming platforms. So how does that translate into streaming platform numbers? Uh, can they acquire new audience? Can they acquire new numbers? Can, and I think that's, that's where the, the real question lies, like what kind of content? Uh, I anticipate totally different type of content. What works on a box office will not work to the the streaming platform because uh, the streaming platforms have a different demographic compared to. But right now, everybody doing that that kind of a 
Just in case. Just yeah. in case to see which demographic are watching Malaysian uh, streaming platform content. And once we have that, I think then we get to see a more streamlined and more focused kind of a output in order to serve those market. At the same time, I think the box office is progressing as well. Um, we're going to have a lot of Tengkolok movies <laughs> and the Silat movies uh, capitalizing on the on the success of or leveraging on the success of Mat Kilau. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, for the next 24 months, it'll be fun Silat phase. Lovely. But how does it affect the, the FTA platforms, the free-to-air platforms? I think everybody, that's, that's the kind of question that everybody have in mind right now. Uh, and what make it worse, I would say, the nightmare continues after the, I think, abandonment of no, the ad spend. Because that's where, that's where the problem starts, yeah, because yeah. now agencies kind of realize, uh, yeah, Nelson do give rating, but there's no verification, there's no transparency, there's no, how do we compare to the analytics provided by, let's say, YouTube or, or social medias and, and it's much... That's in real time. Yeah, and, and, and the numbers, the analytics are a bit more accurate with precision and all that. So that, that kind of have a, the first exodus of, of revenue, uh, all channels affected by it. And the second is how, how do they, are they going to, with roster? So FTA, the problem is also always has been roster, which is you have a 8.30, you miss the 8.30, that's it, you miss the show. Um, but I think it, it works still, except it's going to find its own space. It might be the FTA, it might be the new radio. <laughs> when 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 digital came out or, or when TV came out, what happened to radio is pretty much gonna happen to FTA with all these platforms and internet and and um, FTA will have to be the second tier kind of uh, because I think digitalization have crept across every fabric of society that is almost no one has no internet access and once you have an internet access, you are you open to to a lot of free platform, not only subscribe uh, platform, uh, you have the AVOD that you still can watch for free and things like that. So FTA will have a massive, uh, I think massive catch up. And it's a real conundrum because now you don't have the ad spend, mm. but at the same time, you still have to fight for the space or fight for survival and, and no one really have the answer. And also need to invest in new content. Exactly. New and, hours. and it's a very expensive. Uh, imagine like if you are FTA compared to a YouTube, democratize, decentralize, uh, the users themselves uh, upload their content and everybody get to watch compared to, let's say, uh, TVX, let's say. Mm you have to fork out your own budget and you create a roster and, and the technology. That's only on the content part where I think some of the most expenses are in the tech as well, which are the transmitters, the receivers, uh, the satellites. And those are the things that uh, cost a lot as well. And, and I don't know how they're going <laughs> to... And, and a certain demographic is already on TikTok. Exactly. And they are getting, means their dopamine. Live hit. feeds. Yeah. Like, and, and, and this is not... I think solely to Malaysia, I think you could see with international broadcasters, you could see news, especially like with what's going on in Gaza. Mm. CNN, BBC, they're so far lagging behind because people just get real news on, on real time on social medias yeah. that you feel like when, whenever you watch BBC or CNN, it's almost like a rerun of a show. It's like, that's, that's yesterday's news. That was like three hours ago. Exactly. But right. now the, the fire brigade is already there. Exactly. So, so everybody, I think the traditional or conventional uh, media kind of grappling for survival to exist, merely to exist because finding relevance in, in how the society progress is a major task for them. And whoever that can, can, can come out alive out of it, I think will have longevity, but we will see a lot of consolidations, acquisitions, or even, you know. It is happening at this point of time. While you speak, there, there are a lot of, you know, changes happening in Disney. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of changes happening at, at Warner. So it's, it's not like it's a yesterday's news. It's, it's real time. Things are changing. Uh, as we speak and I think with the next one year I think there will be a lot more the whole 
you know, the whole scenario is going to change. I mean, uh, and that's how business, I think. And, and that, that opened up, I think, a different kind of doors. I think when, when, whenever we have conversation, uh, I think we always, we always look at the exclusive viewpoint or, or, or uh, you, we're putting a glass from slightly insulated, slightly exclusive to, ah, it's the Malaysian industry, it's the local industry. But for me, after working with in, in few countries, I always see it as a regional, like the, the sooner we embrace the regional space, it opens up a lot more doors. I mean, like, uh, at least for Malaysia, we always look at Malaysia plus Singapore plus Brunei. Mm. But imagine Malaysia plus Singapore, Brunei and Indonesia. We are talk- suddenly we are talking about a 300 million population kind of opportunities. And I think until we, we realize how much potential we have in that regard and how much eyeballs that, that waiting you know, to see content. Because I think after being in Indonesia, they are not that picky, hmm. but they have the sophistication. Obviously, they have slightly different taste compared to Malaysia, but I think different, not too different. Uh, most of them listen to Malaysian music as well. So it's not too, what they call, not too foreign to them. Um, and it's just about conviction, back to conviction. Like mm-hmm. once we believe that if we have or we produce good enough output, the people on uh, Indonesian, be it Java Island or Sumatra or Kalimantan, will always want to watch it. And I think uh, it translated through few of the view program. I think some of the projects on view gained some sort of traction uh, in Indonesia. And I think that kind of opened up doors of conviction. So people may look at it and say, ah, the Indonesian can consume Malaysians, Malaysian content. There's a, there's a chance for other shows to gain that sort of uh, acceptance as well. And, and I think the more people believe in that, I think the better it will be for our industry. Given the recent challenges and controversy surrounding finance, uh, what are your thoughts on the leadership issues and how do you believe that that can be resolved to support the Malaysian film fraternity better? I think I have like different view when it comes to finance. I think everybody kind of have over expectation of what finance should do, what finance should be, uh, the role function of finance. A lot will kind of expect finance to be the ATM machine, the policeman, the referee, the museum. But I think the reality is if we look around the region, I think we have one of the most functioning with the with intent and purposes uh, in the form of finance. And it's not helped by this, by, by the fact that it's, it's this over expectation that is also being used as political tool to give us brownie points and, and cookies, uh, political appointees. Uh, now we have less of that, but it used to be. Second is also uh, goodies, you know, in the form of goodies in order to gain sort of optics. We can't deny the fact that with movies also comes with glitters and the glamour. So whoever that sit on the leadership of within this field gonna get to rub their shoulders with, you know, all the who's who of the industry, which is easily turned into optics and headlines and all that. So the politicians or the politics side see as, as something that they can leverage on. So once you combine these both factors, over expectation and, and over hoping with someone who see this is a nice tool, then the convergence always, you create a different kind of beast. And when the polit- politics was stable, it was slightly okay. Uh, but once you have four mini- prime ministers in four years, then things become a bit too crazy. But what Finas has become also is a bit scary. If you ask me, the buck stops at the top, which is the producers. And most of the problem that we have in this country is once you have producers who are not equipped to be producers because they don't know how to be producers and what the job of being a producer entails, that leads to a major disaster because whoever that become the leaders on the political side will ask the people at the top, which are the producers. So if you have somebody who knows nothing about producing, claiming they are producers just merely because they are money bags, then the kind of answers that they're gonna provide to the powers that be 
won't be a true reflection of what the industry needs. Exactly. Therefore, the translation of that is we're gonna get totally out of touch kind of solution from the powers that be. The powers that be think, ah, is the capital injection or the, the, the liquid is the hindrance of Malaysian movie industry. Let's pump in money. And uh, by the way, uh, we're gonna have election next year, might as well we pump more money and we get more optics and let's hope these producers can you know, can uh, gain the hearts of the artists, therefore the artists can start tweaking that they love our parties, things like that. So it's not helped by the fact of that when I think if people ask, and a lot of people ask me, like especially powers that be like, what do you think will be the first thing that we should do in order to, to, so to solve the whole conundrum in movie industry? You cut the numbers of producers by half, you separate, you separate, the title between producers and investors, that will solve half of the problem because most of the producers that call themselves producers in this country are investors. So you can give them different incentive, different kind of help, uh, tax rebate, tax deduction, whatever, because you are only doing or you only participate as uh, investors. You are not doing all the checklist that, that comes with, with you know, what producers are uh, uh, the, the job description of our producers because once you have separation and then whenever the powers that be ask the producers like you like ask you okay what 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 how can we help your requirement will be totally different from the people who claim they are producers yes. but they are just financiers because they will be talking about something totally you know unrelated to production and i think that is the the real crux of whatever problem because we have we have mislabeled a lot of position in this country and at the mid tier bottom tier i think it's not so problematic but once you have a position like producer being mislabeled i think that's that that started the whole it's, it's almost like we're building a sand castle it's frivolous and the foundation is weak the, is the foundation is weak so how are we how are we going to build a, a more sustainable how are we going to progress with a weak foundation and i think with finas coming in now i think the leadership now are our former MDEX and I think uh, the composition of our our board members or board board director are, are practitioners uh, and I think we have a nice composition as well. We have uh, people from legal background, um, I think with, with finance as well. Uh, we have Ilan from the, the artistic background, we have uh, Fatima Bubaka practitioner. So I hope uh, the fiduciary is sorted. In terms of plan, I think we can only chart our own plan. If we wait for Finas, then it just take another change of government or cabinet reshuffling for everything to be back to drawing board. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I don't think we should depend on Finas. Wow, that's 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 some <laughs> <laughs> heavy one. Um, and you're right in something because at least now people who are there in the leadership role they can uh, talk film and television. They know uh, from a digital camera yeah, to a to a to a film camera. Yeah, they know yeah. the difference, which was not the same uh, two years ago. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we can only hope for the I, best. I I think they should be referee, like people said about about the the prolonging issues of acquisition uh, price between broadcasters and let's say production houses. Like the buying price have not gained much now. They have gained a bit, but they have they have they had not gained for at that time. I think fifteen to eighteen years. Uh, I think during the COVID that they, they, they kind of like uh, gained by 15 percent. I think twenty percent, something like that. But it had not gained up to that point for I think eighteen years. The issue was I think everybody wanted Finas to solve it, but Finas uh, had no jurisprudence, uh, jurisprudence. Uh, uh, capacity to because broadcasting is not part of Finas. Yeah, yeah. The, so Finas could do nothing to the broadcast, uh, the broadcasters. So I think there's a lot of over expectation, and that is one of the the best would be I think for them to focus either they want to be developmental body, which is a grassroots helping uh, uh, archiving, or they want to be a sort of a bit more uh, trade which is helped with the international sales, international collaboration, which is on the trade side, or they just want to be a sort of commission, um, like high commission overseeing 
on the oversight, which is a bit like referee, yeah. mediators, yeah. or moderators. Uh, right now, they're, they're having so many hats, and, and it's almost like with each new, <laughs> with each new uh, leadership, trying to outdo the previous one by putting more hats in order <laughs> to show that they are better. <laughs> And eventually, they're overwhelmed by, by all this because each of these variables or components already have a... a it's like, if you are a judge, you want to be a lawyer as well, and uh, you want to be a prosecutor as well, and, deep, and you go like, wait, 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 this is so you many things. the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. But having said that, means uh, there are a pros and cons in it. Means I, I can only compare with our neighbors, yeah, like yeah, yeah. how IMDA does that in Singapore. And what Finas is doing here, what IMD is giving is international exposure, going to the right conferences, markets where Singaporean producers are seen, their work gets sold, pitches, are, I mean, fundings can come to the pitches. So I think uh, there's a great uh, bunch of learning which I think Finas can have from IMDA, what IMDA trying to do, and vice versa from IMDA to Finas. And uh, I think uh, there's a lot to be done in that space. And I think with, with the right leadership in place, I think uh, we can only dream of, of getting to that uh, level where we can be seen around, around the world as great content creators and, uh, and great uh, you know, market to be in. I hope so. And, and, and Finas have around, I think, 330 over uh, workers, workforce. Which wow. is a sizable, it's a sizable organization, and they have, and and on top of that, we have Finas Penang, we have Finas Sabah, Finas Sarawak, so we have like uh, Finas in in in, we have regional Finas as well, and a lot of people uh, kind of overlook, and one of the main responsibility of Finas is overseeing the licensing for karaoke as well, and that's where the main staple is, that's where the revenue generators for Finas. Oh. Licensing of karaoke and imagine it's like the monies that come from karaoke licensing goes to uh, you know uh, DKD projects and things like that. And it's coming back to at the end of the day, what does Finas want to be? I think that is the main like IMDA developmental, uh, half trade, half development, or you want to be uh, a funding body. A funding body. Um, but every year, it's almost we we kind of keep hearing that at some point uh, they want to be sustainable. And every year, also in terms of of being relevant and being you know, to entice themselves to the industry, uh, there's always an almost a need for money to be given. You know, whenever I rub shoulders with the powers that be, I always tell them it's so easy to if I'm a grandpreneur, uh, it's so easy to because the whole DKD was using producers, you know, to help producers. But if you don't have a stringent, strict guidelines, you know, the definition of who uh, producers are or, or definition of producer, imagine this, I have a bit of money, so I put the money, 50,000 in a company, in a register as a number hut, and that's what it takes for me to register as producer with FDM, uh, with PFM, and also for DKD. I apply, I go to MMU, I give 1,005 and hire the best student from graphic uh, department in uh, MMU and I get like super shiny deck and I send to Finas and I present and uh, the panel will be like, it's super good. We have no reason to turn it down. He only asked for 1.5. I have seen movies worse than this at two. Might as well we support him 1.5. And then once the, he gets the money, then he can pocket 1 million. And he asks some up and coming director 500,000. And you have you always have eager young directors like, yeah, I, want, I can do it at 500. And, and, and then once he fail as a producer, I just I gave him chance. This is what happened to the young filmmakers. We gave them chance. They never take it and they never utilize it. And therefore, I need to apply again next year. <laughs> I think this is, this is the kind of cycle which has been going on. Yeah, and and this is like and this is even this is yesterday's news. This has been going on for, and it's not only leakages from from the fund per se. The second problem is, once you have this type, the output of it is going to go into Sharat Wajib Tayang roasters. Now you have a second problem. 
because this type of movies, which is 70% of our movies, fill up the syarat wajib tayang. Now the wajib tayang, almost 100 titles per year are already crammed with this type of movies. So after three movies of such, imagine as a as an audience who you know your your salary is two thousand to five thousand household that's where the our dem demographic is you save some money you bring your family to cinema and then you see a half big movie and after three times you say ah enough with malay movies I, I i i hate malay movies they never you know meet my expectation then the third problem is trust deficit and it takes a lot of effort to bring back the audience to the cinema and to gain they trust back. They trust back, and and uh, my cycle. I think the curse. It, the, I I used to call it the curse of my career because every time I used to have this curse of my movies <laughs> always come out after four bad movies, <laughs> <laughs> and this this happened like five six years back, and that's when I realized that pattern because I was like, why why my movie have to come out after like four bad titles? Because by then people just lost interest to watch. And it took them Astro, you know, Astro first or during Raya, and then you see them again. Like, I love your movie. I love Malasa. And I was like, well, you love Malasa? Where do you watch it? Oh, Astro during Raya. And I was like, oh, no wonder. Okay, I wish you watch it in the cinema because that would have helped Arwa Mama Khalid to, you know, mm -hmm. even though it, it took a bit of time for him to to have, to have the success of Kalima, but it would have been much sooner, and and it would would it would have been better for everyone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, Bron, how important are international collaborations like Gundala uh, for the growth of Malaysian cinema on the international stage? I think if we can take uh, uh, the career, perhaps of of Jokwanwa, I think there's there's a uh, there are a few milestones that we can cornerstone that we can actually uh, have a reflection on. Uh, so, you want the Asian project market in Busan? with Copy of My Mind, and it came with a three-picture deal with CG Entertainment now as an international uh, sort of representative sales rep. So the first project was Set and Slave, hmm. and I think second was Gundala. So the, the Set and Slave kind of was distributed to 46 countries and, and opened up so many doors for, for a lot of us. So the, the traction of Gundala came after that, but now we get to see in the real sense, the big picture, like you, the aspirations and the conviction also is about the possibilities of looking at international cooperation, the needs for the content to be universally ac accepted comes with uh, international components. And I think some of the work in Gundala was done in Bangkok. I think the, the, the mixing was... So it's, it's Indonesia made with some cast from with a cast from Malaysia, <laughs> with some work in Indonesia, some in, in Thailand. And if we want to look at that model, I think we we pretty much have to approach or adopt the same kind of style where we have to redefine what is Malaysian product and and how much it has to be ethnocentric before we say, ah, oh, that's not Malaysian anymore. Uh, does Malaysian product have have to be in Bahasa Malaysia or Bahasa Melayu? Uh, or what about if it's uh, in Bahasa Melayu but directed by not Malaysian? Do you define that as Malaysian product despite all the cars are, are Malaysian? Or you have uh, a totally rojak components on the behind the scene but the project set in Nusantara, everything else is Malaysian. How, how do you define, and, and, and I think uh, that has been our conundrum as well. Uh, the powers that be have problem with definition, whereby the Hollywood is pretty much basic. It doesn't matter which country you are from. Uh, if you're producing uh, on a MC kind of a structure, then it's, it's, a, it's a Hollywood movie. It's American. It doesn't matter you are from Middle East, you're from Africa, you're from whatever. And I think it's industry-based, it's trade-based, it's business-based. Only domicile will, de will, will define the, 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 the flag of the country. And I think that is a nicer model formulation to adopt. Like, I would love to see a lot of, you know, a lot of brain, great people, great talent 
coming to the Malaysian industry and build the Malaysian industry. We can't we can't be having ethnocentric like yeah it has to be Malaysian only. Then then you get 100% Malaysian but nothing else in terms of quality because it takes so long to build to build a generation of of quality players. Yeah. The only the only way to fasten it you get to see with football. You have legacy heritage players. You have naturalized, uh, neutralized players, yeah. and suddenly Malaysian play like you know a, a nice regional. Uh, some might say, but that's not really Malaysia. Well, it depends on what type of Malaysia you want to see as a football. Malaysian team, team is winning, right? By the yeah. end of the day, yeah. that, that's more important. <laughs> that's that's yeah. yeah that's that's uh, and now we're talking about movies. We're talking about about industry, and I think the the real knowledge transferring come through working together. Uh, I work with you, and then over the time, over the course of working with you for three months, then I absorb. Imagine, like if I work with somebody from you know other countries, then once you you get to work together, we get to rub shoulders, then we're gonna form a different kind of working culture, uh, different kind of synergy, different kind of the way that we look at things, the way we solve things, and only through that can we come out. I think as a better craft uh, craftsman. As a producer, what are the key elements you look for in a project, and how do you balance creative vision with commercial viability? <laughs> <laughs> I normally we, but we never see ourselves as commercial. You know, like I always see it separately. The stories are the story. The package or the packaging is the packaging. Um, so the packaging is in journal. I can tell a different story in a different journal. So if so, you want. Uh, if you want it to be a bit more commercial, you can package it in action genre, or a bit more commercial but with less budget horror genre. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the story is the story. But but most of the time, every time we develop, we kind of have this process where we kind of reverse engineer it. Like uh, we look at it and how much does it cost uh, in relation to how much this kind of movie generally generates. And if the numbers is not match, then the risk is a bit too much for us to take, and therefore the the developed idea will get chunked into the dustbin. And uh, <laughs> that happens quite often. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, like you know, once you create, you try to to put your your creator's uh, hat and you just develop, and then once you do the breakdown, like, it just makes sense. Uh, we're not gonna be able to make our money back, and therefore we have to abandon the project. That, that's that's painful. Yeah. Um, there's a criticism which keeps coming from from within Malaysia. That is our, uh, that our film struggle to penetrate the international market. Don't even dream of Hollywood. Uh, even in Indonesia, it's very tough to build a pathway. Uh, what's your comment on this issue as someone with a respected reputation in, in the Indonesian market? I think the real problem is the divergence of preferences and tastes. What works in Malaysia, for instance, comedy especially, what works comedy in Malaysia will never work in Thailand nor Indonesia because every time you you let the Thai watch Malaysian funny movies, you go, what's so funny about this? It's very insular, very, it's very insular inside. and also random, which is the Malay called merepe and the Malays generally we like merepe. So random jokes or the next level is uh, you know insiders jokes or perhaps uh, sexual innuendos. Mm. It's a bit. But sexual innuendos using wordplay or pun, hmm. which is a bit insular. Hmm. Uh, so it's very hard for you to translate through subtitles for... Uh, whereby it's much easier with slapstick, uh, if well made. Uh, then, you know, if there's a production value, because slapstick is physical, you, you kind of see like somebody got bashed with the head, ah! And, and you know... But not be laughter kind of a thing. Exactly, but, but at least it translates visually where it doesn't require language. It's just physical language and pain and just reaction and people, ah, it's a bit three studios, but I can understand. It's funny, silly funny. But once you go into the random wordplay and all that, so it's very hard to 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 cross the boundary of language or culture. Whereby the, the Thai still use uh, slapstick yeah. and they just kind of fuse it. So the international audience, if you, you kind of, you don't get the translated messages or subtitles, 
at least you be entertained by the the silliness of the physical the physicalities of the humor uh indonesian is also the same i think they are good at fusing uh half physical half what what play kind of uh, and there's also the sophistication of the uh, of the production i think with the thai's uh, p mark for instance there's there's a lot mm. of physical mm. physical uh humor in there as well um you get to see the production value there's is always there's there's always a discounted kind of creative flow which is a bit like this year but on the, on the creative side discounted creative flow which is it's almost like to certain producers if we do horror we don't need too much light because it's going to be dark anyway <laughs> therefore we can do it cheap uh if we do comedy uh we don't need production design why should we why why should we color code it why should we have color blocking why should we have like we don't need all this is uh, people just going to look at our actors three silly actors doing random stuff we don't even need a script a proper script in fact you know some people will, will approach it like that because especially with the flavor of the man kind of comedian so the script is just a pretext for us to work on but it's actually i just want to use your randomness you can improv whatever you want we're going to show it <laughs> it's like an improv show rather than a film exactly so so with that kind of format it may work locally because the actors are the flavor of the man and sometimes it also you know most of the time it doesn't work because the cycle from ideation to release formulation movies is around 12 to 18 months when you hire that particular actor he was the flavor of the, the month of that of that time by the time the movie released there was somebody else who was bigger than him and 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 that's i think that's that goes back to the the idea of what producers job entails mm-hmm. and until we take certain genres seriously as well uh it's not easy to make uh comedy and it's not easy to make horror yeah. and we shouldn't discount our effort to co- to do comedy and horror then only i think we get to see but those two genres i would say the easiest to and safe uh, and safe in terms of investment doesn't require much uh the next is i think action but but it's a bit it's a bit expensive. yeah it's a bit more expensive but you get to see like uh, pulau uh done really well in 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 cambodia mm. um so There's there's always a hope. I I never you know lose hope with Malaysian content. Um, especially after I work in a lot of countries, I can realize when it comes to Thailand, there's there's not too far um, apart in terms of the quality. It just like we have great sailors in different different department of the galleys. It's just that we always been on the wrong voyage or under the wrong captain or in the wrong ship. given the right shape with the right captain i think we have all the the talent we need to execute uh, something good also at this point of time there are a lot of uh, uh, you know innovation happening and there are a lot of trends which are changing in the malaysian film industry what are they and how are they shaping the industry like what like the volume you mean no the volume Version the production. the story uh, storytelling part of it uh, we're going back to basics with with the history part of it folklore yeah uh and also uh you know some polish stuff war on the other hand i mean war movies are quite quite a regular phenomena in the theater these days so those are the new trends which we see and how is it shaping the 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 industry i think for the past weirdly if you look at the the historical you know um market Oh, only movies that produce at more than five million make up the highest grossing all time. Maybe having Kalima as an outlier, but other than that, four million above. So it means like uh, Malaysian generally watch once you you give them the production value, entertainment value, or some sort of certain value. Uh, but with that kind of a price tag comes with also a uh, uh, quite an amount of i think uh, marketing budget in order to reach out to the to the whole masses i think in terms of taste i wouldn't i i would say malaysian are a bit easy and responsive reactive when it comes to movies because compared to other countries uh, malaysian generally no problem watching subtitles yeah 
that's that's already a, a easy tool is we have a tradition of watching movies from all around the world we we the indian segment alone we have malayalam we have tamil we have bollywood we have like even different segment just on the indian and and on the the chinese side we have mandarin cantonese mandarin taiwanese mandarin so so korean thais uh, so Malaysian generally exposed to to a lot of stories from different different parts of the world, and I think uh, it's just about aligning their their taste in that particular cycle. Uh, I'm quite saddened by the fact that Pagari Bulan didn't really uh, make it, but I think it's due to the marketing budget rather than the quality of the movies. So far, people who have seen it kind of appreciate and like it uh, right now La Luna as well people we have yeah. seen it like that no. it just that people are watching it like they're going back twice or thrice exactly yeah. uh, it just like you know whether it's the timing uh, you know with with the war in Gaza and things like that but now like I said earlier like we we have progress uh, the, the making our team our technique uh, there's there's a lot of uh, innovations in terms of of technique as well we get to see uh, a lot of Content uh, project higher council. Who would have thought uh, will will gain such attraction? My only beef or my only concern is consistency. Yeah. How can we? How can Keep we consistently? Yeah. Uh, can we consistently churning out at least B kind of a so B and A? We don't we don't go below certain par that yeah. that that we set uh, regardless of genre. So you can make comedy, but we would love to see comedy with you know full production design, good lighting, good acting, like you know nice narrative. Uh, so those are the things that I think everybody kind of hope for for Malaysian industry. And once we have that, I think uh, we might be in a Thailand situation because Thailand right now the domestic market is dead. Yeah. So they rely on international market. Uh, they have no choice but rely on relying on international market, but you get to see good content coming up from Thailand still. And they're selling a lot of their formats to international market. International market. So at some point, I think uh, if there's a if there's a will, there's a way. Hmm. Uh, and the sooner we believe, we have conviction in our own talent, in in the the people of of this country that that we have a lot of talent in different different department. I'm not only talking about the acting circle but also technical writing a lot of things i think uh, yeah we 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 have the potential uh, which brings me to the next question is uh, as an intu- influential leader leader no la- <laughs> in the film fraternity what leadership qualities do you think are essential for nurturing talent and driving the industry forward care care um coming from artistic fraternity and came out from film school, I kind of, I started the whole industry I think, on the wrong footing in a way that there's always a sense of capitalism equals oppression. <laughs> 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 it's always, and, and it's not helped because that's, that was how the industry was being built, especially if you're coming from behind the scenes, so like the producer taking advantage of us, the producer taking advantage of us. So once you get that thing drummed over your ears, you're kind of like, yeah, the producer take advantage of it. <laughs> and you know, you just want to have a revolt and like, you know, and, and over time you, you kind of learn a bit more about, ah, but they don't have any margin at all. Yeah, because of the buying price have been like this, da, 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 da. Then, then you understand and, and slowly you, you kind of see the big picture and, and the longer you are in industry, you kind of open up your own companies and you see like, ah, oh, I don't know how these people kind of sustain over the, like, you know, for <laughs> yes. us to sustain, like, you know, it's crazy and, and things like that. You, you gain more respect over some some of the senior producers, or, like real producers. At the same time, you yeah, can... <laughs> yeah, be, be more, yeah, like, you know, like, like, like real producers. So, and also at the same time, you kind of feel also for the workers because like, you can never, and, and that's why I, I, I kind of quit. I kind of stopped acting for TV. Because it reached the level where everything has to be favored in order for it to move. Because it's like your price is too low for me, my price is too high for you. But there's no point arguing because I know you're not making much. But it's 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 almost like if I were gonna say yes to something on the on the, especially on the FTA, it has to be a favor. Therefore, I kind of like yeah, can I just do a cameo? So 
you still get to use me or use my face for for promo but uh it requires less commitment for me to commit you know in 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 the form of working hours or working days and things like that and and but not everyone can operate like me because it's a it's a it's a career so yeah. a lot of people depend it's on business, it and yeah. and how do we can how do we need in order to create a sort of so i think the answer is care which is do we care for growth do we want to make the pie larger in order for producers because i think as a businessman you also we need profitability to incentivize excellence yeah and right now i think it seems like the whole ecosystem incentivizes mediocrity yeah yeah you're hitting the nail in the, in the head yeah. right now yeah because because if in order for you to to create something good you will go extra mile mm-hmm. but how long can you sustain as a company by keep keep you know keep spending getting the best people from each department because those are it come it, it become yeah, pricey as well and it's not helped by the fact that with each good project that you supply to the broadcasters it become a default yes standard to them it's like ah coming from a bit i'm expecting like this and then the next one if you give like this i'm like hey bro we expecting something better than you from from you and you go like, um, the other project was like this ready so and and that's 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 what's happening and and if there's any care that that the care for growth the care for the whole community to grow as an industry because only through that then you become whoever that produce excellent excellent projects will gain uh, monetary profitability and growth for their companies then you get to see company grow out of making great content yeah uh, people make making a lot of uh, money out of being the best in in their field like the best uh sound record is the best cameraman we get loads of money because they are the best in in that regard and i think care is the the keyword here like care to see the growth of everyone and i think that's what have been incentivized in in the rest of the neighboring countries uh maybe because of the cinetron has a larger pool of audience therefore the developmental in terms of talent is easier for them is the same with thailand in malaysia due to the impending death of fta the one that we mentioned just now maybe the streaming content will be the one that lead the charge in terms of marching towards uh, incentivizing excellence that's that's a great answer actually there's an opinion that in the man, in in managing the film industry film practitioners should be given priority to head prominent roles including in finance because they know the industry's needs better What are your opinions on that matter? Depends, I think. Um first, I don't think any real practitioners will want those roles. Really? Real practitioners. I think all of us are we <laughs> this is is but the seniors perhaps, but it it also comes with with because it's is strategic management administration which goes against a lot of things that <laughs> <laughs> practitioners who want uh who are so used to short gig yeah it's because our industry is a bit like oil and gas like we get it together <laughs> six months doing one thing and rap and then development for six months and then you go on another round different kind of battlefield with different team or similar team or same team and go into another war and and imagine going from there to 9 to 5 meeting 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 i i don't that's that's why it's it's a routine or it's a chore that i don't think uh real practitioners but maybe the seniors the one who uh you know towards retirement towards retirement but even then i would say i don't think they can handle the day to day i think on the advisory le- advisory maybe uh being part of the board maybe mm-hmm. but to be let's say uh ceo ceo um but i can understand the sentiment i think th- it boils from the frustration that ah they don't understand us mm. it just it just the whole the whole idea of yeah we should have film practitioners to 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 be the head of finance mm. purely boils from the fact that the frustration that you know it comes it came from the frustration with administration is what's the point of having a body that manages if they don't understand us what's the point my as well they put one of us in there but i think i would say what's the point of having one of us in there if if the person 
because once you're in there, you need to understand what fitness entails as well. Like how many departments and uh, now like, you know, licensing karaoke is not only movies. Uh, then you realize, ah, broadcasters are not part of Finas. Therefore, you cannot go and try to solve the problem in the TV industry. And once it's firm, how much can you solve? Because some of the problem that comes with the film industry lies in the state, state laws and not federal. For instance, entertainment tax. Hmm. You can only beg the state like, yeah, can you lower it a bit? Da, 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 da. So things like that, I think, I can understand the sentiment, I can understand why, the cause for it. But I would say advisory, no problem. Uh, but if we have the person who are maybe with some sort of experience in running an organization on the administration side, at least maybe five years, then yeah, maybe. Because I think the, the, the job required a different skill set. So now going into the VC mode. Yeah. Uh, so every filmmaker, every indie filmmaker is looking out for funding and yeah. investors to yeah. get their film made. You as a VC, <laughs> okay. what tips can you give to young independent filmmakers to get their next fund, uh, project funded? I struggle as well. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's because, because I never use VC to fund creative projects. Okay. Uh, but mostly the, you know, I... We kind of uh, we invested in fintech, uh, agrotech, you know, things that that have a bit more of of uh, unsexy. Maybe fintech is sexy, but you know, agrotech is is not that sexy. Uh, payroll kind of a uh, app, maybe that is slightly, but never for creative. But I would say. Maybe that's a, a right way. I'm trying to, to start one. Um, maybe there's a way to approach it. And it comes with... I think it solves certain problem. It solves transparency, it solves accountability, which has been also a sort of conundrum for, for I think, for investors when, in relation to production. But for young, I think project market is the best way to go because you know you you get to meet the speed dating round first once you get accepted you know that oh from 300 or 200 submissions you are one of the 10. Uh, that's normally how we gauge the ideas because it's unbiased so it's kind of like somebody uh, from the other part of the world kind of agree that the project that you submitted or the project you're working on have some sort of um, bus that they like that means that we share same sentiment that this project is something there's something interesting about it and then once you go to project market then you get to meet you know the distributors you know you're going to meet like the speed dating session will come with 10 to 15 people from various parts of the world which going to allow you to kind of gain feedback from them from from different you know, background. So the festival will come in with their notes like, yeah, I think the project has a bit, you know, problem in this and that and that. It doesn't matter whether you use or you don't use the notes, but at least you get the notes. And then some people from the broadcasters will say, yeah, maybe if you don't have this, uh, we will consider, you know, for our knee. And, and through that, you can form a sort of a big picture of what the project can be in terms of US producer. And also the commercial aspect, because now you're going to gain a lot of, of notes from commercial aspect as well. And therefore, I think you can formulate the next step, which is um, uh, the, the, what they call the financing part of it. But most of the time, if you meet 15 people at some point, you're going to you know, gain some sort of ideas in terms of financing. It basically gives you a clear picture whether it's going to yeah. fly or it's not going to fly. I think, like, for instance, I think we, we wanted to do Donor It first, but then uh, One to Jaga was selected for the Singapore project market. And when Namron kind of won the project market and it came with the sponsorship of the camera for 20 days, then everything had to stop. And it was like, ah, oh, because it came with a expiry date, which is... So we are like, we have to find money within nine months in order to, <laughs> to make this movie and we don't even have a script. <laughs> But, but then it set a goalpost and, and it kind of like, and, and it's almost like you can't let somebody else see the potential in you more than yourself. Yeah. 
and with that happening it kind of like everything just happened quickly it's like yeah we need we need to sit down and and finish the script and 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 do the breakdown and and gather the team and and so it's a good goal post but everything else had to stop in in a way uh, and a lot of project kind of go through that kind of project a uh, kind of a sort of a ordeal as well so i would young filmmakers young producers i would say project market is the best way to 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 do a lot of things okay looking ahead what is your vision for the future of malaysian cinema domestically and internationally to be the uk to the indonesia hollywood if we see ourselves as solution provider to the indonesian because first let's admit they have the 300 million population pulau jawa alone java island alone is 150 million population that means logistically java island one thing hit 150 million get everything compared to us 33 split between borneo and peninsula that's one if we see ourselves on a complementary mode we're going to solve a lot of things to the indonesian because right now indonesian as much as is fast growing also have a lot of pain points they are running out of crews running out of ads running out of dps running out of directors because of a lot of streaming platform kind of hot the big players therefore it create a sort of a void that needs to be filled so it's like the space still needs to be filled who's going to fill it now there's an opportunity for a lot of i think um people to go in and and i think with streaming platform also allows for scouting mm. because now the indonesian don't have to come to malaysia to watch malaysian content yeah. in order to spot ah who's the coolest actor who's the so whoever that get to do anything i think if if because i've i've come across people who say yeah i don't need to go all out because it's not hbo uh, you know this is like some prominent local you know uh, practitioners and i was like why do you have to wait for hbo or big projects to come in order for you to to fully maximize your talent because i always see it like this if you never run 100 meter full hatter hmm. thinking that i can run i can run below 10 seconds but i never run below 10 seconds because i don't want to run below 10 seconds i would tell you the moment you want to run below 10 seconds it won't happen hmm. because now you don't know how to run anymore because you never get yourself accustomed to yeah. running full like running to your full potential and coming from my career i know that you you are just one shot one shot inch of being spotted by somebody yeah you never know who's gonna see your work where i got people from when when i did a uh, for his bill uh, when i did half was the producer saw it in berlin Joko sauce my film in KL and it led to two of them talking and like yeah let's let's try this Malaysian actor oh uh, i got filipino producer saw one of my films in tokyo so you never know who's watching your work mm. and what kind of problem are they facing in their own country and sure enough when when i think one of the actors kind of pull out from half walls they ran, they ran out of actors like to who could who could use a uh, english dialogue and they kind of like, yeah maybe we try this Malaysian actor and let's send three scenes for him to audition and yeah alhamdulillah i got the role but but that's what i meant by you never know yeah you're right you you're right know. you're right so this year what are the best five content pieces you have seen imagino is for sure my top okay i only plan to watch la luna later yeah the year has not ended yet my god <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not going to plug my own movie. I'm not going to plug my own movie. Uh Lock of movies I haven't seen. I haven't seen. I was in Bangkok for 3 months shooting. Okay. Mm, I was in Jakarta early of the year and I was in Bangkok in June and yeah, I haven't seen a lot of stuff unfortunately. Hopefully next year is going to be a lot more viewing of a lot of new content going on at the moment. I think a lot of stuff has come i just hope that you know whoever that you know push out content um malaysian do give a second chance or at least yes. give a chance to watch um 
merely because I think the the A B testing period is also very important. Very important because that will set the direction for 2025 at least. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so right now is the phase of what is Malaysian, you know, what is Malaysian watching, what kind of content, because that will sort of form a sort of conclusion. They have to form conclusion whether it's a space worth investing. Yeah. And whatever numbers that can help uh, in terms of viewership or. Uh, Because I know for sure that uh, they are not keen before this. Because every time uh, they produce things in Malaysia, those shows got bashed on social media. Yeah. Unlike you know content from Thailand or Indonesia, I think they have a habit. If you, they don't like it, they don't really post it. <laughs> Malaysian yeah, like yeah, if they like it, yeah, they yeah. don't really post it. Yeah. So it's, it's the other way around. So if they don't like it, they love posting it. If they like they they like it, they just like it. or they go quiet, completely quiet that they don't even want to congratulate you if yeah, you made yeah, great content. Yeah. So I think that's that's the hopefully, uh, especially with yours. And now we have Budak Flat. We have a couple of shows. Hopefully, uh, but please do watch that cover girl if you can. I su- I subscribe, but then you know it's it's uh, time. Yeah. Uh, I just saw Ted Lasso, and that was very late. Oh, yeah. season, <laughs> season three. Exactly. I, I I just saw the first two seasons, and it's very late already. But thank you so much, Ron, for coming on the show, and really, really appreciate you being thank here. Thank you. You're always being very kind to all our requests coming in whenever we we ask you to come. And I know be, there's uh, no durian this time around. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so. Um, Thank you so much, and hope to to see more of your stuff on screen Thank next you year. And till then, keep stewing. You too, and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.